In the LDS Church, the restoration of the Melchizedek Priesthood is heralded as one of the greatest events in modern times. It ushered in a newfound connection to God and a return to the proper ordinances of God's kingdom. However, upon inspection of historical records, the dominant narrative quickly collapses and a much clearer explanation emerges. In the LDS Church, we are taught that John the Baptist appeared on May 15, 1829, to confer the Aaronic Priesthood on Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, and then a short time later, Peter, James, and John appeared to confer the Melchizedek Priesthood and the Office of Apostle, which is claimed to be the highest office in the Church. While it is true that John the Baptist conferred the Aaronic Priesthood upon Joseph, which is described in Doctrine and Covenants section 13, it is far more ambiguous as to what and when transpired for Peter, James, and John. You would think, though, that far more specifics could be given for such a monumental event. The LDS Church does say that the restoration of the, of the Melchizedek Priesthood was likely between May 15, 1829 and August 1830. This is because of a number of sources which point to this time range in one way or another. Each of the sources hold various clues, however none are very definitive as to when the event occurred and what exactly transpired. In the LDS version of events, Peter, James, and John appeared to Joseph, confirmed him as an apostle, and gave him all the priesthood authority he would need to govern the church. Later visits from individuals conferred keys, however, Joseph never received any higher authority. Therefore, it is logical to conclude that apostle then is the highest priesthood office in the church. This is, in fact, the official doctrine of the LDS Church. This distinction is vital to show that Brigham Young had all the authority he needed in order to govern the church, since he was an apostle at the time of Joseph's death. However, as will be shown shortly, this is very inaccurate. While there is no doubt that Peter, James, and John appeared to Joseph and confirmed him to be an apostle, this visit is actually canonized in Doctrine and Covenants section 27, verse 12, which was added in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants. There is, however, literally no evidence to suggest that Joseph was given the high priesthood at this time, and there is a large amount of evidence to suggest that he wasn't. This distinction is vital to show that the office of apostle is not the highest priesthood office in the church, and there is actually a higher priesthood for select individuals. This will be shown in some detail, however, it is pretty clear our current understanding of things is not wholly accurate because of scriptures like Doctrine and Covenants section 20, verse 38, which states, quote, an apostle is an elder, end quote. If the office of apostle is contained in the larger office of elder, and an elder is not a high priest, then logically it is impossible for apostle to be a high priest also. If apostle is not a high priest, then we would of course need that authority in order to officiate in the church of God. We can see this requirement in Doctrine and Covenants section 107, verses 64 through 68, which states, quote, Then comes the high priesthood, which is the greatest of all. Wherefore it must needs be that one be appointed of the high priesthood to preside over the priesthood, and he shall be called president of the high priesthood of the church. Or in other words, the presiding high priest over the high priesthood of the church. End quote. Therefore, we can see that the president of the church must have the high priesthood and therefore be a high priest in the church of God. 
Brigham Young recognized this issue. However, he didn't need to concern himself with this because at that time, he was already leader of the church. He remarked, quote, Now will it cause some of you to marvel that I was not ordained a high priest before I was ordained an apostle? Brother Kimball and myself were never ordained high priests. How wonderful! End quote. It is honestly not clear how Brigham could claim to have the high priesthood when he explicitly denied having it. It is also not clear how an apostle can be a high priest when an apostle is an elder, which is not a high priest. In February 1831, Joseph received a revelation, which we now have as Doctrine and Covenants section 44, in which Joseph is instructed to call the elders together for an important conference. In that revelation, God says, quote, It is expedient in me that the elders of my church should be called together, from the east and from the west, and from the north and from the south, by letter or some other way. And it shall come to pass that inasmuch as they are faithful and exercise faith in me, I will pour out my Spirit upon them in the day that they assemble themselves together. End quote. Joseph was obedient and called several elders together for the important conference that was held June 3rd, 1831 to June 6th on the farm that was owned by Isaac Morley. We have several accounts of the amazing manifestations that happened during that conference. I don't want to overwhelm you with quotes, however, it is important to realize the sheer magnitude of what is being described. Joseph even remarked before the conference that, quote, not three days should pass away before some should see their Savior face to face, end quote. Regarding the conference, Joseph remarked, quote, on the sixth on the 6th of June, the elders from the various parts of the country where they were laboring came in, and the conference before appointed convened in Kirtland. And the Lord displayed his power to the most perfect satisfaction of the saints. The man of sin was revealed, and the authority of the Melchizedek priesthood was manifested and conferred for the first time upon several, several of the elders." End quote. It is very curious to note that Willard Richards crossed out key aspects of that entry and hand-wrote a more modern interpretation. However, the original certainly fits the rest of the statements much better. As was mentioned previously, it is very important when studying church history to ensure the records are as original as possible. Regarding the conference, John Whitmer wrote, After the business of the church was attended to according to the covenants, the Lord made manifest to Joseph that it was necessary that such of the elders as were considered worthy should be ordained to the high priesthood. The Spirit of the Lord fell upon Joseph in an unusual manner. After he had prophesied, he laid his hands upon Lyman White to the high priesthood after the holy order of God. And the Spirit fell upon Lyman, and he prophesied concerning the coming of Christ. End quote. Another statement regarding the conference from Lyman White. Quote, A conference was held at Kirtland, represented by all the again saw the visible manifestations of the power of God as plain as could have been on the day of Pentecost. And here, for the first time, I saw the Melchizedek priesthood introduced into the church of Jesus Christ as anciently. Whereunto I was ordained under the hands of Joseph Smith. And I then ordained Joseph and Sidney and sixteen others, such as he chose unto the same priesthood. The Spirit of God was made manifest to the healing of the sick, casting out devils, 
speaking in unknown tongues, discerning of spirits, and prophesying with mighty power. End quote. Another statement from John Carrill, who has an excellent history of the, ch- of the early church. He says, quote, The Melchizedek priesthood was then for the first time introduced and conferred on several of the elders. End quote. The last statement is from Parley P. Pratt, who wrote, quote, Several were then selected by revelation through President Smith and ordained to the high priesthood after the order of the Son of God, which is after the order of Melchizedek. This was the first occasion in which this priesthood had been revealed and conferred upon the elders in this dispensation, although the office of an elder is the same in a certain degree, but not in the fullness. End quote. From these statements, we can see that several people, including Joseph Smith, felt that at that conference, the Morley Conference, the Melchizedek Priesthood was introduced for the first time into the church, along with the office of high priest. This was, of course, after the visitation of Peter, James, and John. It was also recorded that after Lyman White's ordination, then, quote, he stood on his feet and testified that he could see the heavens open and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, end quote. This is obviously a major event in the church. However, we have received almost no information pertaining to this conference. In the newly compiled History of the Church, Saints, Volume 1, this is the entire mention of that conference. Quote, As the family cared for Eliza, her father attended an important church conference at a schoolhouse near the Morley Farm. He was gone several days, and when he returned, he told the family he had to leave again. End quote. That is certainly very light information for such an important conference in which people saw Christ and the Melchizedek Priesthood was introduced. It is also very light, considering the conference was where Joseph received Doctrine and Covenants section 52, which called several people on missions. Therefore, you would expect the official history of the church to have at least a bit more information considering this important conference. Lastly, why did several people testify to the fact that Lyman White ordained Joseph and Sidney to the high priesthood when we know Joseph was already an apostle. According to the official LDS explanation, an apostle is higher than a high priest. Therefore, Joseph certainly didn't need any additional priesthood authority. Why also was the Melchizedek priesthood given to elders? Shouldn't they have already had it? From the conference, we know 23 people were ordained as high priests, and all were elders except Martin Harris, who was a priest. Therefore, according to traditional LDS belief, Martin shouldn't have been a high priest. Joseph also stated that the office of apostle had nothing to do with this higher priesthood, or Melchizedek priesthood as we would call it today. Joseph stated that the Melchizedek priesthood, quote, was not the power of a prophet, nor apostle, nor patriarch only, but of king and priest to God, to open the windows of heaven and pour out the peace and law of endless life to man. And no man can attain to the joint heirship with Jesus Christ without being administered to by one having the same power and authority of Melchizedek. End quote. In this same talk, Joseph actually described how there were three orders of the priesthood in the church, namely Levitical, Patriarchal, and Melchizedek. And at that time, in 1843, the Patriarchal Priesthood was the, quote, greatest yet experienced in this church, 
End quote. This is a very fascinating discussion, which warrants its own dedicated focus. However, it certainly should be noted that as of 1843, Joseph mentioned that the church didn't enjoy the Melchizedek priesthood anymore. The book, Joseph in the Gap, describes this quite well, and I would recommend that book to anyone interested in this subject. In the LDS Church today, almost every male, if they simply show up to church, is given them the Melchizedek priesthood. However, God doesn't seem to treat the priesthood as trivially as the LDS Church does. In the JST of Genesis 14, Joseph wrote, speaking of the Melchizedek priesthood, quote, For God, having sworn unto Enoch and unto his seed with an oath by himself, that everyone being ordained after this order and calling should have power by faith to break mountains, to divide the seas, to dry up waters, to turn them out of their course, to put at defiance the armies of nations, to divide the earth, to break every band, to stand in the presence of God, to do all things according to his will, according to his command, subdue principalities of po and powers, and this by the will of the Son of God, which was from before the foundation of the world. And men having this faith, coming up unto this order of God, were translated and taken up into heaven. End quote. I frankly wasn't worthy of this priesthood power when I turned 18, and I seriously doubt most 18-year-olds are currently either. This power should only be given to the most trusted and proven of all of God's servants. The Melchizedek priesthood is the highest power of God available to us, and we haven't seen this level of power in the church since the very early Kirtland era. Certainly, we haven't seen this level of power recently. The pandemic would have been a perfect opportunity for the leaders of the church to demonstrate the power of God. However, we sadly saw instead the power of the government over men. It is certainly clear that Peter, James, and John appeared to Joseph and transferred the apostolic authority according to Doctrine and Covenants, section 27, verse 12. However, there is no mention of the high priesthood being conferred, and many records suggest that it actually was at the Morley Farm Conference. It is also clear from things like Doctrine and Covenants, section 20, verse 38, that the office of apostle is not part of the high priesthood, and therefore this high priesthood is needed separately in order to govern the church and have more fully the blessings from God. This distinction is very important in order to realize that as of at least 1843, the LDS Church no longer had the Melchizedek priesthood, according to Joseph Smith, and there is no record of it having been given back to the church. This matches exactly with what Joseph received on January 19th, 1841, which was canonized as Doctrine and Covenants section 124, where God confirms that the higher priesthood was indeed removed from the church. Quote, For there is not a place found on earth that he may come to and restore again that which was lost unto you or which he hath taken away, even the fullness of the priesthood. End quote. Frankly, if Brigham had all the authority he needed to continue on after the death of Joseph, then what in the world was God referring to in 1841? If the fullness of the priesthood was removed, according to God, then how did we get it back? If it was removed, then what are we giving men in the church as soon as they turn 18? Are we claiming to have the highest priesthood available and yet we don't? Are we taking the sacred name of God in vain by perpetuating the false traditions of our fathers? 
As always, thanks for figuring things out with me.